Hi, welcome to Local Matters. I'm your host, Ken Moore, and I have with me as my guest today, Sheriff Tim Svensson. Welcome to the show. How Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank like I said, when me. you walked in, uh, I imagine this means that there's not such an emergency in the county right at this yes. moment that you can be here. I'm glad yes, of that. Yes, yes, I'm glad to be here. All right, well, thank you. Well, uh, Tim, I want to just start out by asking you, at what point in your life did you say, I'm interested in wearing a badge and carrying a gun? You know, uh, I would have to say it probably goes all the way back to when I was a fourth grader in elementary school. All right. And a Columbia County Sheriff's deputy showed up with a, uh, a canine, and uh, he talked about what the dog did and how he used the dog as a, as a tool. And from that point forward, I was just fascinated with, uh, with the career concept, the idea, and, uh, and really wanted to be a canine officer. Uh, I started off, I think, in the fifth grade wanting to be an Alaskan state trooper. I thought it would be really cool to ride snowmobiles. But as I moved through my, my life and I went off to college, I realized that probably wasn't uh, the, the best plan. And so, uh, so, yeah, so I've always wanted to get into law enforcement. And, and through high school, I've always wanted to, to help people. Did a lot of work with Dornbecker Children's Hospital and a lot of stuff with high school leadership. And so it just from that point forward, I just everything I did in school and everything I did in college was directed specifically for a career in law enforcement. How did you come to Yum Hill County? So I went to school at Western Oregon University. Uh, the, the summer between my junior and senior year, I needed to do a uh, internship for a term. And uh, my uh, family, I had a grandma and an aunt that lived here in McMinnville. So I uh, reached out to Yamhill County Sheriff's Office. At the time, it was Norm Hand was the sheriff and uh, asked if I could do a uh, internship here. And they brought me on board and I uh, worked throughout the entire summer for free, lived with my grandma here in town. And uh, they had an application process open up right then and there. And I applied and got hired on as a deputy. So that first summer, what was something you remember from that summer? What were you experiencing? Uh, what I spent, well, the part that I, it was interesting, it's come, you know, it's interesting how you never know what you're doing at that time, how it's going to affect your career down the road. But at the time I was, uh, inter um, doing an inventory of our evidence room. And I had a log of every single piece of evidence. And my job was to look at the evidence on the log, track down the judgments from the court, and determine what we could do with it, whether we could get rid of it, destroy it, or needed to keep it. And then I put together a report for the evidence tech at the end of the summer that said, here's the number of things we have in our facility. This is what you can get rid of. This is what you need to keep. And this is what you need to go do with this stuff. And then as you move forward in my career, when I became a sergeant and was an administrative sergeant, I took over the evidence room. <laughs> and so I was in charge of the evidence tech. And so I had a really good understanding of the documents that we needed to be receiving from the courts that we either weren't getting or they were lost in the shuffle. And it helped out tremendously when you inventory an evidence room when you've done it once before. So it was a, it was a good experience back in summer of 99. And uh, it came uh, very handy in probably about 2007, 2008, when I was charged with uh, supervising the evidence room. All right. All right. Well, that is a great story. You've been sheriff for two months now. Correct. So is there a big difference between having been um, a sergeant, a captain, excuse mm -hmm. me, a captain, and now being sheriff? Yeah, you know, as, as the captain, you're doing a lot of the, a lot of the behind the scenes work. Mm -hmm. uh, you're attending a lot of meetings. You're managing the day-to-day um, but operations. Now you're, now you're the face. Now, now I'm the face. Yeah. I'm the policy guy. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, and I really stride on and I pride myself in being available to anybody anytime. And so what the struggle right now has been in the first two months is um, having enough time in the day and having enough days in the week to be able to meet with everybody who wants to come and meet. And, you know, as far as the transition within our office, uh, our budget and transition of personnel and the daily operations of our office had been doing it for so long and I have good support staff that I brought up behind me that that's just a seamless transition um, but now this the challenge is now is um, I want to be everywhere I can't mm -hmm. I have to uh, weigh the the office and the family and uh, but for the first two months it's been fun it's been great and uh, I continue to to look forward to you know further down the road where I can start being more involved in community events Oh, that's great. That's good to hear. The, um, when an officer, when, excuse me, when a deputy arrives mm -hmm. on a scene, there's often, you're not sure what's, what's going on, what's, what's happened, what's about to happen. 
there's a lot of unknowns. You come wanting to help a situation, mm -hmm. cooperate to bring things to order, and yet there may be a need for conflict immediately. Yes. So you constantly have this conflict, cooperation kind of mm -hmm. duality going on in your mind. How do you train officers to, for that? There's often a question like, what do I do now? Yeah, you know, uh, training has, um, has over time transitioned to more of a hands-on uh, scenario-based type training. Uh, when I was at the academy, they were just starting the scenario-based uh, training, uh, which meant that we would go downstairs in the basement at the academy, and you got two rounds of these basically paintball type rounds that went into a revolver and they only gave you two because they're very expensive and they put it in a, a holster that it barely fit in and they asked you to walk into a room and take care of a situation that could or could not it may lead to deadly force or it may not that was the extent of it you know we spent like three days doing scenario based type training now uh, our deputies are coming out of the academy with 16 weeks of training and the first couple months or for a couple weeks are book work and classroom but they have almost 80% of the academy classes all um, on a continuum, and it's all scenario-based. And every level of the training builds on the previous level. So by the end of the academy, they can go into a situation and go from zero to really bad real quick, and they're reacting just, by they're the just reacting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and the, the struggle in law enforcement is that things constantly change. Mm. And so within our office, the struggle is as we bring them back and we continue to train them, that we are constantly providing enough training within our office so that uh, they have the most up-to-date um, case law, that they have the best um, tools uh, to use, and that they have a good understanding of what the best technique is to uh, take care of a situation. And, and like you said, it happens just like that. And... Uh, you know, I'm a huge sports fan, so I, I refer back to the Super Bowl and the decision that the Seahawks had to make at the last 30 yeah. seconds on mm -hmm. whether they're going to throw a pass or not. Oh, why did you remind me? Yeah, I, well, so, <laughs> but I use that because as you think about it, it's, it's very good in law enforcement because we will talk about that decision, and we have been talking about it. It's yeah. been two months, and they're still talking about it yeah. on Sports Center, And they're going to continue to talk about that until in, into the preseason next year. In law enforcement, we don't have the benefit of being able to talk about it yeah. for that long. It's that you have to make that decision. Um, I stand by Pete Carroll for making that call. They did it exactly what he needed to do in that situation. Yeah. And uh, the same thing in law enforcement. We, we have to react, and then we'll spend the next six months deciding a better way to do it next time. Um, about training. You contract with several towns mm -hmm. in the county to provide their, their law enforcement. What are those? Correct. What towns? Uh, are those? We've got the city of Wellamina and Sheridan in the West Valley, and then you have the city of Dayton and Lafayette in the central part of the county. So plus, okay, so that's four, four out of Four cities. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a significant difference between patrolling a rural area and pat patrolling a city? Yeah, especially with the contract cities. We build those contract cities to be as much of a police department um, yeah. um, you know, feel as, as possible. You know, in essence, the supervisors and the captain on patrol are like the police chief for that city. And we want those cities to have deputies that are in those that are both, um, you know, I have an understanding of what the community needs are because each community is different and have every available tool necessary to deal with everything from a barking dog and code enforcement mm -hmm. all the way up to a, a typical um, you know, person-on-person -person type crime. So this is a, an additional type of training to be yeah. to be a police, be a more of a police presence than, takes, a, than a yeah. It takes a different presence. yeah. It's a different uh, just more of a just a different paradigm shift. You know, it's a paradigm shift with our staff on how they deal. You know, we deal more in the public. You're mm -hmm. walking around mm -hmm. at public events more than you are yeah. just driving around on in the rural parts of the county. Um, and we pride ourselves in allowing our deputies to take the time to get out of their vehicles go into the local businesses, yeah. go to community events, you mm -hmm. know, and go into the high schools to the basketball games. You know, be a presence. Um, yeah. There's more to law enforcement than just out enforcing uh, crimes. I'd like to give you a platform to say what you would like to say to four, four different groups of people. Mm -hmm. And I'll, um, what would you say to parents? What would you say to kids? 
what would you say to homeowners and what would you say to drivers? And just from your experience, when yeah. you arrive uh, on a situation, you've been taught some very graphic lessons, I'm sure, mm -hmm. and these yeah. have come home to you in, in a way. So what would you say to parents based on your experience? Well, for parents, especially if you have young children, there's a lot of studies out there that show that the early exposure to some sort of traumatic event to, for a child hinders their, their learning, hinders their ability to uh, be successful in a school setting. So for parents, if you have issues, because everyone's going to have issues, they're going to have conflicts, they're going to have financial problems, whatever. Do whatever it is that you need to do, but try not to do it around the kids. You know, try to keep that family-centric model as much as possible. If you have to have discussions outside, you know, bring in other people to help with that. So you're saying if you feel that you're getting close to an abusive situation with your child, be really careful and because ask, you're going to put them help. and ask for help. Yeah. Because uh, otherwise, the result is that child will have experiences that will lead them to be yeah. being seen you well, a see, lot more. They, yeah, they're going to they're gonna start. You know, when when you hear parents say, "Oh, I, that my child," and, you, know, you can see a lot of my my husband in that mm -hmm. child. Well, mm -hmm. that's because they're they're mimicking the behavior that they yeah. see, and mm -hmm. that's how they're learning. And uh, so, yeah, if you can if you can find a way to to keep the children away from that, it's just as bad to have that type of, of, of a situation as it is if it's an actual abusive situation. What would you say to kids? Uh, for kids, specifically, uh, social media right now is a big deal. Um, be careful. Be very careful. Yeah, it, there's some benefits to it. There's, there's some good things going on with social media. But you've seen... But I've seen, I've seen very bad things happening. Every front, everything from cyberbullying to um, showing pictures of them committing crimes. Uh, you name it, it's there. Uh -huh. And what kids don't realize right now is you want to move on in your life and you want to go to college. Colleges are looking at what you're doing in middle school and high yeah. school to see if they're going to bring you into their college. And then even farther down the road when you get into college, your employers are going to look back and say, okay, what have they been doing the last three years? And Facebook, no matter how much you say, um, I've got my settings private, mm -hmm. it's not private. What would you say to homeowners? <laughs> homeowners. Um, Specifically around our area, um, do whatever you can to set up your house to be not the target. And I, and I say, uh, one of the things I studied in college was crime prevention through environmental design. It was called SEPTED. And the idea, the concept is that if you have a br brush in, or bushes in front of your house mm -hmm. and it's growing up over the windows and you can't see out because the brush is so tall and you can't see the house, cut them, trim them up, keep yeah. them nice and... Don't give an opportunity for someone to sit behind and hide behind those bushes. Keep the outside of your house well lit. Uh, keep your doors locked. <laughs> keep your car doors locked. Uh, don't, don't provide crimes of opportunity for, for people walking through your neighborhood. All right. Well, I was going to ask what, uh, what would you say to drivers, but we don't have time because okay. I want to touch on one more Not thing. Not a problem. The first time I met you, we were at a NAMI meeting, National mm -hmm. Alliance for the Mentally Ill, <clears throat> and you were um, a darling of theirs, I'll just say that, because of how you had brought training to your officers about how to deal with mentally ill. Can yes. you just give us about yeah, it's, a 15-second uh, review it's of what you did crisis intervention there. team training. It was on the West Coast. It finally came over to the East, or from the East Coast to the West Coast. Uh, we've par partnered with Marion County. It's a 40-hour, one-week course where deputies get hands-on training with uh, end users, uh, mental health clients, uh, to learn how to deal with people in crisis in a different way. The mm -hmm. ultimate goal is to keep um, those vulnerable populations out of our jails and into the services that they need because they're not going to get any better in jail. That's great to hear. Well, it's been 15 minutes already. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess you're going to have to have me come back. I will. I'm only time. halfway through. Yeah, not a problem. Well, Tim, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, I appreciate it. I Anytime. know that it's valuable to the community to hear from you, and thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks no. for the community. Thanks on, for having on me. Local Access TV. I appreciate it. Thank All you. Right. All right.